Hello guys, welcome to lecture four of our lecture series, Chemistry for Engineers. Today, our topic will be on stoichiometry. So our objectives for today will be calculating relative atomic mass. I think we've looked at that before in our last lecture, as well as the relative abundance of each isotope, relative molecular mass, understanding the chemical composition of gasoline, which is basically simple. It's only hydrocarbons. Understanding chemical equations for combustion to calculate products of chemical reactions, as well as reactants needed for product. Understanding percentage yield of a chemical reaction, as well as additives in gasoline and their uses. Stoichiometry is referred to as a quantitative calculation for chemical reactions. So you're basically just dealing with numbers, numbers and calculation. Very important, a balanced chemical reaction is key to understanding any quantitative reaction. So when you balance a chemical equation, it actually provides mole ratios for all reactants and products. To use these ratios, we usually have to convert information from something such as mass, volume, or reactant. So in order to use these ratios, we use usually have to convert something. Usually have to convert information from something such as mass or volume or reactant or products to mole. This establishes the main pattern for solving stoichiometry problems. We usually convert from moles to mass or volume of the unknown substance. Another type of calculation that can be considered in stoichiometry problem is a percentage yield of a reaction. In this case, the amount of product determined in the problem present a theoretical yield. So in terms in terms of calculating the relative atomic mass, the relative atomic mass is the average mass of one atom. The relative abundance of isotope is basically gaining an average of the total number of isotopes that exist and calculating an average. Say for example, carbon has three isotopes. Relative molecular mass of a molecule is the average mass of one molecule of a substance when compared to one twelfth of the mass of carbon. Chemical composition of gasoline, as we say, it's very simple. There are mostly hydrocarbons. So as we can see here, these are different examples of hydrocarbon. Methane, ethane, propane, butane, the most common four hydrocarbons. Methane comprises of one carbon, four hydrogen. Ethane comprises two carbon, six hydrogen. Propane comprises three carbons, eight hydrogen. Butane comprises four carbons, ten hydrogen. Calculating the product of chemical reaction is very important, especially when you want to to understand the percentage yield of a chemical reaction and it also will assist in calculating the reactants needed for the product. It will also give an idea as to a quantitative value as to the reactant needed to produce a product. Gasoline additives can be alcohol such as methanol, ethanol, ethers such as methyl tetrabutyl ether, MTBE, tetraamyl methyl ethyl, TAME or Terichary T-H-E-M-E. -E. So as we mentioned before, stoichiometry refers to the relative relationship between the amounts of reactant and product in a chemical reaction. So it's basically giving a quantitative value of the product and reactants. So here we can see two hydrogen atoms react with two oxygen molecules to give you two water molecules. The relative atomic mass, as we've mentioned before, is basically the mass of a single atom divided by by one twelfth of the mass of carbon. So for example, carbon dioxide molecule has a relative atomic mass of 44. In order to calculate the relative atomic mass, you'll have to know the atomic mass of carbon, which is 12, plus the atomic mass of two oxygen molecules. We know that the atomic mass of one oxygen is 16 grams, so 2 times 16 is 32. 32 plus 12 equals 44. So one mole of CO2, or 6.0 02 times 10 to the 23 molecules has a mass of 44.01 grams. Isotopes are atoms of the same element that have different numbers of neutrons, as we mentioned before. Chlorine, for example, has two isotopes. It has an isotope with an atomic mass of 35 and an isotope with an atomic mass of 37. So the relative abundance of isotope 35 is 75%. The relative abundance of isotope of chlorine 37 is 25%. The relative atomic mass of 
an element is the average value for the isotopes of the element it takes in account the percentage of abundance of isotope so it's basically saying that 75 percent of chlorine atoms exist as chlorine 35 while 25 percent exists as chlorine 37 so in order to calculate the relative atomic mass 75 percent times 35 plus 25 percent times 37 which is the atomic mass gives you 35.5 so the relative atomic mass of fluoride is 35.45 and here we can see this is just basically creating emphasis so the relative atomic mass of chloride 35 this exists at 75 percent abundant the relative atomic mass of chloride 37 is 36.966 which basically gives a percent of 24.20 percent if you add the relative atomic mass times the percentage abundance of each each divide by 100 you basically get the percentage of relative atomic mass of chloride the relative molecular mass of a compound is the mass of one molecule of that substance relative to the mass of carbon atom all of these weight mass calculation is using carbon atom as a standard we know that oxygen has an average atomic mass of 16 and oxygen basically comprises of two oxygen atoms so that means that the relative atomic atomic mass of 16 would be 16 times 2. The atomic mass of oxygen which is 16.00 times 2 would give a molecular mass of 32 for one oxygen molecule. The relative molecular mass of CO2 is also easy to find if you understand that you would need to know the molecular weight or the, the molar mass of each atom. So for example, the relative molecular mass of carbon dioxide which is CO2 you'll have to find the molar mass of carbon which is 12 as well as the molar mass of oxygen which we already know is 16. This would be 16 times 2 plus 12 that will give you 44. As we mentioned before gasoline is a complex mixture typically contain more than 100 different chemical compounds. The predominant compounds are hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons which are molecules containing only carbon and hydrogen. Most of the hydrocarbon molecules in gasoline are alkanes. These are compounds whose carbons are linked together by a single bond. So these are a list of the alkanes that exist. Methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, decane. As you can see, the molecular formula basically shows that methane is CH4, one carbon four, and as you can see, the carbon atoms will increase by a factor of one for each each. So as you can see, this is one carbon, this is two, this is three, this is four, pentane is five, hexane is six, while the hydrogen atoms will increase by a factor of two. So this is two, this is four hydrogen, six hydrogen, propane, eight hydrogen, butane, 10 hydrogen, pentane, 12, hexane, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22. So most of the alkanes in gasoline contain six and 11 carbon atoms. The general formula for alkane is CNH2N plus two, where n is an integer this means that if the compound contains n carbon atoms then it will contain two times n plus two more of hydrogen if we have alkane with three carbon atoms like for example propane then this will contain c3 2 times n plus two more hydrogen atoms in essence this will contain let me just write it here c3 h2n plus u so n equals three plus 2 times 3 plus 2. This gives us 8. So here we can see propane has 8 hydrogen atoms. For alkanes with 4 or more carbon atoms, there are actually multiple possible structures having the same formula. We call these isomers. So an isomer is 2 or more structures with the same chemical formula. 2 or more structures with the same chemical formula are called isomers. For C5H12, 3 possible isomers exist. And this is pen Pentane. For pentane, three possible isomers exist. As the number of carbon in the chain increases, the number of possible isomers increases rapidly for C10H22. 75 isomer is possible. So for decane, 75 isomers are possible. But as you can see, for methane, ethane, propane, there are no isomers. Butane, two isomers are possible. Pentane, three isomers are possible. Hexane, 
obtain five isomers are possible obtain nine isomers possible and obtain up to 18 isomers possible and so on iso means equal mers means part generally you have two types of isomers you have structural isomers and stereo isomer structural isomers have the same molecular formula but different rearrangement of atom when gasoline is burned in an engine all of these various compounds undergo combustion simultaneously reacting with oxygen from the air octane which is c8h18 if assume complete combustion equation should show octane and oxygen as reactant and carbon dioxide and water as product so the important thing is for any chemical reaction for calculation of any quantitative value from for example the amount of product carbon dioxide and water produced from a chemical reaction we have to start by balancing the equation in this case you have to balance the equation and as we've mentioned in our last lecture we balance our equation by adding what we call the stoichiometry coefficient so here in terms of balancing this equation the coefficients are two so on the side of the reactant and on the side of the product you'll have to balance the equation any chemistry question that asks how much of a particular substance will be consumed or formed in a chemical reaction is a stoichiometry problem so once you're asking for a quantitative number of value is a stoichiometry problem at the heart of every such stoichiometry problem you'll always find a balance equation so the first thing you have to do if you have a quantitative problem is to balance the equation the stoichiometry coefficient that balances a chemical equation refers to the number of particles and not to mass so here the coefficients that, that you insert is referring to the number of particles and not mass masses and volumes of liquids are the quantities that are more likely to be measurable to make quantitative calculations for a chemical reaction we need to convert between measured value of a mass or volume and desired volume of a number of moles so you have to convert between moles and mass to basically get a, a desired quantitative value so such as gram so here we're basically looking at the side of the reactant and we're looking at the side of the product we're looking at two nitrogen atoms so nitrogen hydrogen are diatomic molecules so they always come in two so we look at two nitrogen plus two hydrogen this basically gives a product of ammonia which basically means that you end up with one nitrogen three hydrogen so on this side of the equation you have two nitrogen two hydrogen on this side of the equation you have one nitrogen and three hydrogen when balancing a chemical equation there should be an equal number of every atom on both sides as you can see this equation is unbalanced so to balance this equation what you can do you can insert two here and you can insert three here so we end up with two nitrogen on both sides so this is two nitrogen this is two here and two as well and inserting this three basically gives you six hydrogen so three two six here and inserting this two basically gives you two three six and this is basically a balanced equation so the three that was inserted here or here the two that was inserted here is basically called the coefficient the simplest combustible hydrocarbon and one of the simplest of all fuel is methane ch4 so we can say that the equation shows one mole of methane reacts with two moles of oxygen to produce one mole of carbon dioxide and two moles of water from the chemical equation we can write the following mole ratio so we have one methane to two oxygen molecule one methane to one carbon dioxide which is the product one methane to two hydrogen molecule which is also the product two oxygen molecules to two hydrogen molecules so this is the side of the reactant two oxygen molecule to two hydrogen molecule so if you analyze this in ratio we have one methane to two oxygen molecules we have one methane molecule to one carbon dioxide molecule we have one methane to two hydrogen molecules and we have two oxygen to two carbon dioxide and it's also represented here so one methane molecule plus two oxygen molecule gives you one carbon dioxide molecule in the form of gas and two hydrogen molecule in the form of gas when doing stoichiometry calculation mole ratios are very often written to look like fractions they are used analogously to unit conversion factor relating the amount of one substance to that of another so you basically write it like ratio
ratios. For example, methane, the, the one methane to the two oxygen, the one methane to the one carbon dioxide, the one methane to two hydrogen, two water molecule, two oxygen to two hydrogen. So you basically write it in mole ratios. So methane plus oxygen gives you carbon dioxide and water. And to balance the equation here, they inserted two on this side, a coefficient of two on this side to basically have both sides to have the same atoms. Because from our last lecture, we'll remember that in a chemical reaction, the law of conservation states that matter cannot be created or destroyed. It basically change in a different form. If you start the, the reaction with five atoms, 10 atoms, you should end up with the same amount on the side of the product. So let's look at a problem. In the combustion of methane, how many moles of oxygen are required if 6.75 mole of methane is to be completely consumed? So the first thing you have to do when you get a problem is to balance the equation. So methane reacting with oxygen, if we have 6.5 moles of methane reacting with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water, how many moles of oxygen is required? So here we have methane, two oxygen molecules to give you carbon dioxide, gas and water, right? The coefficient from this equation gives us the ratio between methane and oxygen, which can be expressed in either of the following form. So as we say, you can write it the same way, one mole of methane to one mole of oxygen or two mole of oxygen to one. So the ratio is a one in two or two in one. To calculate the desired amount of oxygen from the known amount of methane, we should use the second form. This gives us the result. 6.75 mole of methane times two mole of oxygen divided by one mole of methane is 13.5 mole of oxygen. So you'll also find that some things are given in grams. So you have to convert or calculate because to carry out the reaction in a laboratory, you often have to use a balance to measure out the material needed. And you usually don't do this in mass. You do it in gram. So we need to be able to convert between grams and moles. You have to use the Avogadro's number as a conversion factor. And remember that we said one mole of an atom is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 particles. One mole of a particle is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 particles. So anytime you get a, a question or equation or a solution, something to solve, and it's asking you for the number of atoms, molecules, formula units, ions, you basically have to refer to the Avogadro's constant. So one mole of iron, for example, would be one divided by 6.03 times 10 to the 23. So you have to convert the moles to mass. So how do you get this 55 gram? You basically have to look at the atomic weight of iron and divide this by one mole. One mole of iron is 55.8 grams. This is basically reflecting the atomic weight. We can see that if we begin with the mass of one species in the reaction and we want to know the mass of some other species consumed or product, we have to use three ratios. So if you want the mass of one species, you have to convert using three ratios. First thing is you have to find the molar mass of a given element and the molar ratio from a balance equation. Then you have to balance the equation and get the molar mass of that balanced equation and the ratio using the molar mass of the substance whose mass you wish to find. So you get the molar mass of the element, balance the equation, and then you get the molar mass of whatever you're trying to find. The simplest and most reliable way to identify which ratio to use for each step is to write all quantities with their complete units attached. How many grams of water can be produced if sufficient hydrogen reacts with 26 grams of oxygen. How many grams of water? So you're trying to find out how many grams of H2O you can produce if sufficient hydrogen react with 26 grams of oxygen. So recall that both hydrogen and oxygen are diatomic gases. So the balance equation is this. Two hydrogen in the form of gas plus one oxygen molecule gives you two H2O in the form of gas. So in order to basically find out how many grams of water you need. So you have to find the mass of 26 grams of oxygen, the mass that is given, the molar mass ratio of oxygen. So you have to find the molar mass of oxygen. So oxygen molar mass is 16. So this would be 16 times two. That gives
gives you 32. The mole ratio between the equation now would be 2 mole of water that will give you 1 oxygen molecule. So you times this 18 grams of H2O. So the 18 basically means that there is 2 hydrogen. Remember that hydrogen has an atomic mass of 1.01. .01. So this is 1.01 .01 times 2 that would give you 2. Oxygen is 16. So 16 plus 2 will give you 18 grams of H2O divided by 1 mole of H2O. And that basically gives you 29.3 grams per H2O. In terms of calculating between gallons and mass, now we can relate the amount of carbon dioxide emitted by an automobile engine and the amount of gasoline burned. What mass of CO2 will be produced for every gallon of gasoline used? Starting by assuming that our simple model using the complete combustion of octane to represent the burning of gasoline. So we're going to use octane as a gasoline. The balance equation is this. So we, we have 2 octane plus 25 oxygen molecule gives you 16 carbon dioxide plus 18 H2O. Here, this is basically just inserted here, even though it's actually talking about theoretical yield and we'll get there eventually. First, you'll have to find the mass of octane. So find the mass of 8 carbon. So carbon 8. So we know that carbon has an atomic mass of 12. So that would be 12 times 8. Plus, we know hydrogen. What is hydrogen? Hydrogen is 1.01. .01. So that would be 1.01 .01 times 18, which basically gives you 18. So 12 times 8 plus 18 gives you 114, 114.23. And here you'll have to find the mass of oxygen, which you already know. The mass of oxygen is 16. So this would be 16 times 2. So that basically gives you 32, 32 grams per mole. The mass of H2O, you already know, as we've mentioned before, hydrogen is 1. So what that's 1 times 2 plus oxygen, you know, is 16. And that basically gives you 18. First, you have to start by balancing the equation, then calculating the mass of each molecule. Because we are basing our calculation on octane, it might be reasonable to use the density of octane, which is 0.725 grams per mil. We convert into gallon. So we basically will have to convert the density to mils because we're dealing with volume. The conversion factor to find mass, you're trying to find the mass in grams of a gallon gallon of octane. So this is the one gallon of octane. You're trying to find the mass. So if you convert a liter to gallon, a one gallon in the form of liter is 3.78. That would be times 1000 mils so divided by one liter times the, the density of octane, which is 0.725 gram. This basically gives you 2659. So this is basically in grams in one gallon of octane. So now we are trying to find what mass of CO2. So what's the mass of CO2 that is produced by a complete combustion of 2,659 grams of octane. So 2,659 grams of octane. You're trying to find out the mass of CO2. So you use the molar mass and the mole ratio for, from the balance equation to set up the calculation. So 2,659 grams of octane times one mole. So one mole of octane octane and as we did before we know that one mole of octane is equivalent to 114.23 as we've calculated with the carbon as well as the hydrogen remember that we said that this would be 12 times 8 plus 18 that would give you 114. You times this by 16 mole of CO2 divided by 2 octane. You basically will have to find the mass of CO2 or atomic mass of CO2, which would be 44 grams and divide that by 1 mole of CO2. You basically get 8,196 gram of CO2. So to basically put this in familiar units, you use the fact that a pound is approximately 454 grams grams. So if you divide the 8,000 by 196 gram, you basically get 18 pounds of carbon dioxide that is produced from complete combustion of 2,659 grams of methane. When dealing with stoichiometric calculation, you'll also have to deal with what we call limiting reactants. When we carry out a chemical reaction, the available supply of one reactant is often exhausted before the other reactant. So you're combining two reactants 
hands together to give you a product usually one might become exhausted so there is so much and no more combinations that you can have so if you run out of one reactant the reactant basically stop because the reactant will need the other reactant to combine to give you the product reactant completely consumed in the reaction is the limiting reactant so whichever one that is completely consumed is the limiting reactant this molecular scale picture illustrates a concept of limiting reactant the box on the left represent the mixture of reactants in our hypothetical experiment six hydrogen molecule and six oxygen molecule in red so the hydrogen molecules are shown in white oxygen molecules are shown in red the right hand side shows the molecule present once the reaction has gone to completion the six h2 molecules and three unreacted oxygen molecules so basically we said that the six h2 molecules and three unreacted o2 molecule here h2 was the limiting reactant because no more hydrogen molecules are available to react with the unbound oxygen molecules so remember that we said that six oxygen molecules so the oxygen molecules are in red so we have the oxygen molecules here that are in red with no hydrogen to react with them and this means that the hydrogen are completely consumed at the end of the reaction so this means that the hydrogen molecule is a limiting reactant so remember that you need two hydrogen for one oxygen so naturally hydrogen is more likely to be consumed your car may run out of gas but it may not run out of oxygen what is more likely to be a limiting reactant the limiting reactant is more likely to be the hydrocarbons right in any calculation related to fuel consumption or exhaust emission it would be reasonable to assume that gasoline would always be the limiting reactant because the gasoline is reacting to form the product of oxygen oxygen is abundant and is highly available so balanced chemical equation tells us the ratio in moles of one substance react with moles of another so this is basically just looking at a limiting reactant here is the reactor that is completely consumed as we know before using the mole ratio in a balance equation so you can find this using the mole ratio using a balance equation as well so for example iron plus sulfate basically gives you ferrous sulfate or iron sulfide so here we can see the limiting reactant is sulfate and the excess reactant is iron so because we have more iron that needs to react with sulfate a solution of hydrochloric acid contains 5.22 grams of hydrochloric acid when it is a allowed to react with 3.2 grams of solid potassium carbonate K2CO3 the products are potassium chloride CO2 H2O the products are KCl CO2 H2O which reactant is in excess so this is basically the skeleton of the equation so hydrochloric acid plus potassium carbonate gives you potassium chloride plus carbon dioxide plus water the first thing you need to do is to balance the equation so with a balanced equation we'll have 2 HCl plus K2CO3 which gives you a product of 2 KCl plus CO2 plus H2O. Quantity of HCl given and calculate the amount of KCO3 that would react completely with it. So basically we're looking for a solution of hydrochloric acid that contains 22 grams of hydrochloric acid. So if you allow this to react with 3.2 five grams of solid k2co3 the products are these which we're looking for the reactant in excess finding the reactant excess we automatically will find the limiting reactant as well 5.22 gram of hcl times one mole of hcl so you'll have to find one mole the equivalent of one mole in gram of hcl so the one mole of hcl would be equivalent to 36 because we have hydrogen times one so that would be one we have chloride times one so one chloride is 35 plus one mole that would basically give you 36.4 times one mole of potassium carbonate divided by two mole of HCl remember we're looking at the ratio one mole of this is basically reacting with two moles of this so one mole of this is reacting with two moles of this so one mole of KCO3 divided by two mole times one mole of CO3 
3 is equivalent to 138 grams of K2CO3. Naturally, we get this by finding the atomic weight of potassium oxygen and divide this by one mole of KCO3. So you basically end up with 9 grams of KCO3. So the given quantity of KCl, which is 5 grams, requires 9.8 grams of KCO3 but we only have 3.2 grams of KCO3 available. So the reaction will stop once the KCO3 is consumed. KCO3 is a limiting reactant and hydrochloric acid is in excess. So basically 5.22 grams requires 9.89 grams of KCO3 and you basically only have 3.2 grams of KCO3 available. So KCO3 3 is the limiting reactant. We're short on KCO3. So here, this is basically showing the representation of iron and sulfate as we discussed previously. And uh, as you can see, the sulfate are represented by the yellow atoms. Iron is represented by the red atoms. In this case, we see that iron is the limiting reactant because we have unbound sulfate here. Ammonia is widely used in the production of fertilizers and is also a precursor cursor to a number of important polymers. So the formation of ammonia from its element is one of the most important industrial chemical reactions. N2 plus 3H2. So 2 nitrogen plus 3 times hydrogen will basically give you ammonia. How many grams of ammonia can be made from 3.50 grams of H2 gas and 18.0 grams of nitrogen gas? What is left? We first have to balance the equation. So we have N2 plus 3H2 gas which basically gives you 2 NH. So you want to check if this equation is balanced? Sure. So we have 3, 2, 6, 3 hydrogen here. 3, 2, 6, 3 hydrogen. We have 2 nitrogen. We have 2 nitrogen here. So you're given the grams of, of hydrogen. So 3.50 grams of hydrogen. So the ratio is 1 mole of H2 divided by 2 H2. 1 mole of N2 divided by 3 H2. Hydrogen. So first you have to find the atomic mass of nitrogen which is 14 so this is 14 times 2 which gives you 28 you also have to find the atomic mass of hydrogen which is 1 which basically gives you 16.3 grams of N2 so H2 basically ends up being the limiting reactant and N2 becomes the excess reactant so we're looking at the amount of ammonia that can be made from the combination of hydrogen and nitrogen gas if you have 3.5 hydrogen gas gas and 18 grams of nitrogen gas what's left we basically have 16.3 grams of nitrogen so what's left is 16.3 grams of nitrogen in that case nitrogen is the excess reactant the reaction that produced tetraphosphorus trisulfide one of the reaction in the combustion of a match is ap4 plus 3s8 which basically gives you ap4s3 if 28 grams of p4 is allowed to react with 18 grams of S8 which is the limiting reactant so it's the same thing again you get 28 grams of p4 you basically find one mole of what p4 is equivalent to in terms of mass atomic weight of phosphorus is 30 and we have four so this would be 30.9 times four that basically gives you 123 grams this times three mole of s8 32.05 times eight is 256 you divide this by the eight which is the p4 the 256 divided by one mole of S8. This basically gives you 21 grams of S8. 28.2 grams of P4 requires 21 grams of S8 to react completely. We have only 18 grams of S8. So there is not enough S8 to react with all the P4. Therefore, S8 is the limiting reactant. So we have 28 grams of P4, which requires 21.9 grams of S8 to react completely. 
Remember, we have 18. So we have only 18 of S8. So there is not enough S8. So we don't have enough S8. We only have 18, but we require 21.9. Therefore, S8 is the limiting reactant. MTBE, which is methyl tetbutyl ether, has been used as an additive in gasoline. And we'll see that in the end. The compound is produced by reacting methanol and isobutene according to the following equation. So you have CH3OH methanol with isobutene, which basically gives you MTBE. So MTBE is basically produced by methanol and isobutene. If 45 kilogram of methanol is allowed to react with 70 kilograms of isobutene, what is the maximum mass of methyl tetbutyl ether MTBE that can be obtained? So basically we have to start by balancing the equation as we already know. We'll need the molar mass for all three compounds as well. Taking care to interpret the parentheses, the molar mass of methanol would be 32.042. The molar mass of isobutene would be 56.10. So we know that carbon is 12, so that would be 2 times 12. Hydrogen is 1, so we have 2, 2, 3 is 6. And we also have one carbon, another carbon, and two hydrogen. That basically gives us 56. MTBE is CH3, and the parentheses is added again, which means that this is three carbon and three threes. And this would be nine here. And we end up with a molar mass of 88. So the molar mass of methanol is known, isobutane is known, and MTBE is also known. So let's get to the calculation so we have 45 grams of methanol allowed to react with 70 kilogram of isobutene and we want to know the maximum mass of methyl tetrabutene or mtbe can be obtained to identify the limiting reactant we can calculate the mass of isobutene with 45 kilograms or 45,000 grams of methanol this could be 45 kilograms or 45,000 grams of methanol here we have to do the ratio as well so we already know that that one mole of methanol is 32 grams. We know that one mole of isobutane is 56.17 grams. So this basically gives us 7.88 times 10 to the 4 isobutane, which basically gives us 78.8 kilograms of isobutane. This tells us that to use 45 kilograms of methanol or 4,500 grams of methanol, we need 78 kilograms of isobutane. But we only have 70 kilograms of isobutane. So the amount of isobutane available will be determined by the amount of MTBE that can be formed. Isobutane is a limiting reactant and methanol is in excess because we need 78.8 kilogram of isobutane and we only have 70. Now the problem is reduced to a simpler stoichiometry calculation starting from the mass of isobutane available. So 70,000 grams of isobutane or 70 kilograms of isobutane times one mole of isobutane which is 56.107 times one mole of MTBE, which is 88.19, basically gives us 1.103 times 10 to the 2 kilograms of MTBE. The solid fuel booster rocket of Space Shuttle are based on the following reaction between ammonium perchlorate and ammonium. So we have ammonium perchlorate and aluminum, giving you aluminum oxide, aluminum chloride, iron nitrate and water if either reactant is in excess unnecessary mass will be added to the shuttle so a stoichiometric mixture is desired so you don't want anything to be in excess what mass of each reactant should be used for every kilogram of fuel mixture we want to ensure that there will be no excess of either reactant because we are asked for the composition of every kilogram we might start by assuming that the total mass of fuel will be 1000 grams so we can write it as this the mass of ammonium perchlorate plus the mass of aluminium is equal to 1000 grams the mass of ammonium perchlorate plus the mass of aluminium is equal to 1000 grams because we have two unknowns we will need a second relationship between the two masses the balanced chemical equation shows us that the mole ratio between two reactants should be 3 3 or 1 1 so when you balance the equation it shows that it's a ratio of 3 3 or a 1 1 which 
whichever, right? So the three, three would automatically also be equivalent to the one, one. We can use molar masses to convert that to a ratio in terms of masses and then use a ratio as a second equation to solve the problem. The molar mass of ammonium perchlorate is 117.49 grams. And so you basically get the molar mass by calculating one nitrogen, four hydrogen, one chloride and four oxygen atoms. You basically get 117.49 grams per mole. And that of aluminum is 26 as we can see here. To ensure that we have a stoichiometric mixture, we need equal molar amount of each reactant. So if we were to use 117.49 grams per one mole of ammonium perchlorate, we need 26.9 grams. We also need the same mole of aluminum. So we can write it like this. So if you divide the 117.49 grams, which is the molar mass of sodium perchlorate by aluminum, you basically get 4.355. And although our actual amount will need to be bigger than those, the ratio of masses will still be right. So now we have two equations for two unknown masses and we can only solve by doing a little bit of algebra. Our two equations are, we have the mass of ammonium perchlorate plus aluminum, which we want both of them to be equivalent to 1000 grams. The mass of ammonium perchlorate is equal to 4.35355 mass of aluminum. So substituting the right hand side of the second equation in the first equation gives 4.355. 4.355 mass of aluminium plus mass of aluminium is 1000 grams. Simplifying that and solving, we get the mass of aluminium needed for each kilogram of fuel. 5.355 mass of aluminium is equal to 1000 grams. You divide the 5.355 by 1000, you get 186 grams of aluminium. Now the mass of sodium perchlorate is easy to obtain because you already have the mass of aluminium so if you have the mass of aluminium all you now need to do is to minus the amount from the total grams which is 1000 so you end up with 813.2 grams so each kilogram of fuel should comprise 186 grams of aluminium and 813.2 grams of sodium perchlorate next important calculation is percentage yield we can rate the efficacy of a reaction by calculating how much product would form on the perfect or ideal conditions and then comparing the actual measured result with the ideal. So the ideal amount of product is called the theoretical yield. The ideal amount of product that you would want is the theoretical yield and it is obtained by working a stoichiometry problem. Measuring the amount of products formed gives us the actual yield. So if you measure the amount of products that is formed, that's the actual yield. From the ratio of actual yield and the theoretical yield, we can calculate the percentage yield. So the percentage yield is the actual yield divided by the theoretical theoretical yield times 100%. When 45.8 grams of potassium carbonate reacts with excess hydrochloric acid, 46.3 grams of potassium chloride are formed. Calculate the theoretical and the percentage yield of potassium chloride. So the actual yield is 46.3. To find the percentage yield, you'll have to divide the actual yield by the theoretical yield and times that by 100%, which basically gives you the percentage yield. Increasing this percentage yield is one of the foremost goals of the chemical engineers working on an industrial process. The salve process is important in commercial production of sodium carbonate, which is used in manufacturing of glass. When 45 grams of potassium carbonate reacts with excess hydrochloric acid, 46.3 grams of potassium chloride are formed. So how do we calculate the theoretical yield? We basically use the 45 8 grams of potassium carbonate and we convert what one mole of potassium carbonate is which is 138 grams we also convert two moles because we get two moles of potassium chloride two moles of potassium chloride divided by one mole of potassium carbonate each mole of potassium chloride is 74.5 grams of kcl so this would basically be 45.8 grams divided by one mole of kcl CO3 divided by 
actual mass in grams divided by two moles of KCl divided by one mole of KCO3. So one mole is 74.5 grams of KCl divided by one mole. So you basically get a theoretical yield of 49.4 KCl. So the actual yield is 46.3 and the theoretical yield is 49.4 times 100 which basically gives you 93.7 percent so here we can see we have an excess of hydrochloric acid so the last step in the process is the conversion of sodium bicarbonate or baking soda to sodium carbonate by heating so we have two NaCO3 in the form of a solid you heat this you basically get Na sodium carbonate plus CO2 and water in a laboratory experiment a student heats 42 grams of sodium bicarbonate and determines that 22.3 grams of sodium carbonate is formed what is the percentage yield of this reaction so again to calculate the percentage yield we need to find the theoretical yield so you need to find the theoretical yield because you already have the actual right so we already have the actual yield which is 22.3 to find the percentage yield you'll have to find the theoretical yield so we can do this by calculating the maximum quantity of the product that can be formed based on stoichiometry of the reaction we have both the theoretical yield and actual yield finding the percentage yield is straightforward because you know it basically dividing the actual yield by the theoretical yield the 42 grams of sodium bicarbonate is equivalent to 84 grams per mole the product which is sodium carbonate is 106 grams per mole this basically gives us 26.5 sodium carbonate so this is basically 26.5 gram sodium carbonate theoretical yield so the actual yield which we already know was 22.3 grams divided by the 26.5 basically gives us a percentage yield of 84.2 percent and remember we refer to the atomic mass of sodium which is 22.9 hydrogen which is one carbon which is 12 oxygen which is 16 to basically give us the total mass in grams and here we have the actual calculated mass of the sodium bicarbonate so we have 23 or 22.99 which is the sodium we have the one which is the hydrogen we have the carbon which is 12 and we have the oxygen the three oxygen which is basically 16 times 3 that basically gives you 84 and if we should look at the mass for Na2CO3 this would also also be 23 times 2 plus 1 carbon which is 12 plus 16 times 3 and that basically gives us 106.0 grams solution stoichiometry deals with the conversion of chemical reactions in volume it basically deals with volume and concentration so the number would be equal to mass times volume so you basically have to balance the equation in moles and a desired volume per mole the fuel hydrazine can be produced by the reaction of solution of sodium hydrochloride and ammonium the relevant chemical equation is here where you have sodium hydrochloride in aqueous solution which basically reacts with ammonia to give you hydrazine plus sodium chloride and water if 750 mils of 0.806 mole of sodium hydrochloride is mixed with excess ammonia how many moles of hydrazine can be formed if the final volume of the resulting solution is 1.25 liter what will be the molarity of hydrazine because ammonia is said to be in excess we know that sodium hydrochloride will be the limiting reactant so we will use the given volume and concentration to find the number of mole of sodium hydrochloride reacting then use the mole ratio for the balance equation to find the number of moles mole of sodium hydrochloride that can be formed we can use the number of moles and the given final volume to obtain the molarity so you convert 750 mils to 0.75 liter and determine the number of moles of sodium hydrochloride reacting so the number of sodium hydrochloride is the moles times volume equivalent to 0.806 per liter times 0.750 liter 
liter that is equivalent to 0.65 mole of sodium hydrochloride. Use that along with a 1 1 ratio of a balance equation to find the corresponding number of mole 0.65 mole of hydrochloride times 1 mole of the same of hydrazine. So basically, 1 mole of hydrazine divided by 1 mole of sodium hydrochloride is 0.605 mole of hydrazine N2H4. To answer the second part of the problem, we just need to use the number of moles along with the given final volume to find the molarity. So the mole is basically the number over the volume. So the 0.65 mole of hydrazine divided by 1.25 liter gives you 0.484 mole per hydrazine. Notice the stoichiometry calculation is done using mole ratio from balance equation. Only the conversions to and from numbers of moles have changed because the reaction is in solution. You basically do this because the reaction is in solution. A common laboratory technique called titration requires understanding solution stoichiometry. A solution phase reaction is carried out on the control condition so the amount of one reactant can be determined with high precision. A carefully measured quantity of one reactant is placed in a beaker or flask. A dye call indicator can be added to the solution. The second reactant is added in a control fashion typically by using a burette. When the reaction is complete, the indicator changes color. When the indicator first changes color, we have a stoichiometric mixture of reactants. So this is basically before the reaction, this is after the reaction, and in this case, you basically should have a color change. So the photo sequence shows some of the steps in the typical titration. One solution is poured in a burette in the left-hand panel. The second solution is placed in the flask, and the burette is positioned above the flask in the second panel. The value on the burette allows control addition of solution and the shape of the Eldenmeyer flask permit easy mixing and swirling in the final panel. The solution in the, in the flask turns pink when the end point is reached. Many common titration involve the reaction of an acid with a base. If 24.75 mL of 0.503 mole of sodium hydroxide solution is used to titrate 15.0 mL sample of sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4, what is the concentration of the acid? So a titration problem is an applied stoichiometry problem, so we will need a balanced chemical equation. We know the molarity and the volume of NaOH solution, so we can find the number of moles reacting. The mole ratio from the balance equation let us calculate moles of hydrogen sulfide or H2SO4. The mole ratio from the balance equation let us calculate moles of sulfuric acid from moles of sodium hydroxide. So because we know the volume of the original sulfuric acid solution we can find its molarity. The acid base reaction will produce sodium sulfate and water. The balance equation is here H2SO4 in aqueous solution plus 2NOH in aqueous solution that basically gives us sodium sulfate and water or Na2SO4 and water. Determine the number of mole of NaOH from the given molarity and volume. To determine the mole of sodium hydroxide from the given molarity and volume, so 0.02475 liter solution from a 0.045, so you basically convert that into a liter, you divide the 0.5 mole of NOH by a liter and that basically gives you 0.012 mole of sodium hydroxide. Use the balanced chemical equation to determine the number of moles of hydrogen sulfide. 0.012 mole of sodium hydroxide times 1 mole of hydrogen sulfide divided by 2 moles of sodium hydroxide basically gives you 6.22 times 10 to the minus 3 mole of hydrogen sulfide. Determine the concentration of hydrogen sulfide or H2SO4 6.22 times 10 to the negative 23 mole of H2SO4 or hydrogen sulfate or sulfide divide by the solution in volume which is 0 0.01500. This basically gives you 0 0.41 mole of hydrogen sulfide. Gasoline you buy is also likely to contain fuel additives. Specific reason for using these additives generally for on the three broad categories to improve engine performance, to reduce undesirable engine emission, to reduce dependence on import and petroleum products. Some additives can be achieved
achieve more than one of these goals simultaneously. In the gasoline industry, the different grades of fuel are usually described in terms of their octane ratings. Higher octane numbers are, are expected to deliver better engine performance. Octane number is really a measure of how highly the gas can be compressed in the engine cylinders before it will spontaneously ignite. This allows an engine to operate at higher compression without unwanted knocking which occurs if the fuel mixture in a cylinder ignites prematurely. The term octane number has its origin in the fact that octane itself is highly compressible. One way to achieve a higher octane number is to increase the fraction of octane in a particular gasoline. What is important is that the compressibility of gas not the amount of octane present. So you have different types of additives, oxygenates, antioxidants, antinox agent, fuel dyes. There are a number of ways to improve compressibility that are easier and cheaper than boosting the actual octane content. The first widely used fuel additives is tetraethyl lead which substantially increased compressibility. From 1920 to 1970, particularly all gasoline sold in the United States contains additive lead and this is basically the structure. But the increased performance and reduced fuel costs came with a price. Lead is toxic and most of the lead introduced in gasoline will ultimately emit into atmosphere and settle in soil and water. The final blow to lead gas came with the introduction of catalytic converters in 1970. As you may know, the catalytic converter is designed to reduce the emission of carbon, monoxide, and other pollutants. The important chemistry of converter takes place on the platinum metal surface. The microscopic lead particles in the exhaust stream position the platinum surface by binding to it so strongly that the catalytic reaction cannot take place. Unleaded gas was introduced and gradually took over the market since 1966. It has been illegal to sell gasoline containing lead additives for use as motor vehicle in the United States. Other additives have stepped in to take on the octane boosting role formerly played by tetraethyl lead but most widely used in the United States today is ethanol. And as we mentioned before, because adding ethanol increases the oxygen content of gasoline, it is often referred to as an oxygenate. And gasoline containing ethanol is known as oxygenate fuel. The added oxygen helps to ensure more complete combustion and therefore reduces the emission of carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, and soot. Gasoline containing at least 2% oxygen by weight is known as reformulated gasoline or RFG. And the use of such fuel is mandatory in some areas where pollution problems are severe. Ethanol for use as fuel additives is produced from crops such as corn, barley, and wheat. Starch form these crops can be converted easily to sugar. The sugar is then fermented to produce ethanol. Because the feedstock or agricultural ethanol production does not rely on import petroleum products, gasoline containing up to 10% ethanol can be burned in any modern automobile and mixture containing up to 85% of ethanol can be used in designed engine. So another additive is MTBE or methyl tetbutyl ether. It was widely used in the 1990s. Like ethanol, MTBE increases both the octane rating and the oxygen content of gasoline and fuel with as much as 15% of MTBE can be used in any modern engine. After the passage of 1990 Clean Air Act, However, the use of MTBE increases drastically. The law mandated the use of oxygenated fuel and the fuel industry saw MTBE offered advantage over ethanol in cost of production and transportation. However, the possible health concern over MTBE called the choice into doubt because MTBE is a possible carcinogen, meaning that it basically can cause some form of cancer. Although the extent of MTBE impact on the human health is still somewhat uncertain. Some areas in the United States actually banned MTBE in gasoline. This is basically just showing types of oxygenated fuel like gasoline, ethanol, methanol. This marks the end of our lecture today. Hopefully this was also informative. So this definitely will require that you guys practice your calculations. That's the only advice I'll have for this lecture and I'll see you for the next lecture.